This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinarian media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. I'd heard stories of vicious mosquitoes forcing people to shelter in their homes during the summer or needing to slather themselves with lotions, potions, and insecticides if they dared to venture outside. Honestly, I really didn't believe them. Okay, maybe a bite or two, but really swarms. It wasn't until I visited Minnesota one July that I was misfortunate enough to experience a dreaded bloodletting mosquito attack. It gave me a much better appreciation for the discomfort our dogs experience when being bitten by mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas. Today's guest is Dr. Ed Kornowski, a Technical Veterinary Services Manager for SIVA Animal Health. We're going to chat about taking the bite out of what's bugging your pet. We'll be right back after the short break, so stick around. Put on a perfectly possum pet party. Having an awesome birthday or adoption day celebration for your four-legged friend? Or just want a fun excuse to throw a fun party with your friends from the dog park? Deck out your party with Molly and Bandit Pet Party Accessories, party products designed specifically for pets. There are wearables, including adjustable pet party hats, bow ties, and tutus. The photo prop kits include funny glasses and hats. The party supplies and decorations include coordinating table covers, party banners, cake decorations, and treat bowls, cups, and bags. Everything you need to create great memories and Instagram-worthy photos. They're available in two colorful themes, Tropical and Fireman. It's a dog's life. Celebrate it with Molly and Bandit Pet Party at mollyandbanditpetparty.com slash petlife. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. Dr. Kornowski, thank you for being with us today. This is a topic that right now during the summer, a lot of people are contending with. It is. It's a annual rite of summer, spring, and it does come upon us every year and I think now it's a time to spread the word that there's something different we can do this time around for our pets. What kind of pests are really out there that our dogs are exposed to right now? So I mentioned the fleas and ticks. Those are the big two that most people are concerned with and depending on geography there are people very concerned with mosquitoes. Depending on further geography more towards the coast uh, biting flies and some of our northern woods folks know that as well. Uh, so we have the big three, fleas, ticks, mosquitoes, and then a third category are biting flies of all sorts, um, whether they're on the coast or the deep woods type, the noceums and that, things like that. Those are the ones we most find ourselves faced with. It was interesting. You mentioned noceums. I was listening to NPR the other day, and they have these male and female anchors that are always talking about language. And it's really fun. And somebody called in saying, yeah, my wife and I were outside. We're in Florida. And all of a sudden, these little biting gnat things were flying around our heads. And she says, I hate noceums. And he thought that was just the cutest word in the whole world because he had never heard about noceums going, yeah, they're the little bugs, they're little biting gnats and midges, so that was kind of fun. But they're not fun when they're buzzing around you and they're biting. Oh my goodness, I really, that mosquito attack in Minnesota was just mm. awe-impressive. So with our dogs and cats, you know, all right, they you know, probably swish their tails and bat at themselves. It's a nuisance for us, but is it just a nuisance for our pets? It's both a nuisance and, I hate to say it, in the worst case scenario, a deadly consequence. So when we look at ourselves going out in the woods, we do tend to forget that we do have our dogs in tow, especially the hikers, the outdoorsy types. So 
we're looking at those as the most prevalent exposed type dogs, but still even the backyard dogs going outside. That's a nuisance to watch them be irritated. And, and that's the pull. That's the feeling we have to, oh my gosh, I, I feel so bad. What can I do? And that's where we look and say, we need to think, yes, it's more than a nuisance. There's some deadly diseases these ticks and uh, mosquitoes carry. I mean, we're talking about everything from heartworm disease to Lyme disease. And it all begins with that dog being bitten. So if we can look at it the same way we feel when we go outside, we don't want to be bitten because it's annoyance. And yes, we can get some of those diseases as well. Some of the tick-borne diseases I'm speaking of. If we can use a repellent on us, what do we have available for dogs? And that's what we really like to focus on now. I know for you and I, we think of, yes, we're going to put these lotions and potions and things on our bodies because we don't want to be bitten at all. You look somewhat like a dweeb when you put your pants into your socks so the ticks aren't going to be crawling up your legs. But here's our poor little pets. They're out there naked and they're just being exposed to all these things. And you're exactly right. You take them hiking and biking with us and out into the woods and they're exposed and, you know, they're smacking themselves and they're scratching, going, come on, hurry up. You know, you're slowing us down. What's your problem in life? You'd mentioned some of the diseases, Dr. Kornowski, that these animals can get exposed to. I'd love to kind of have you break it down a little bit. Uh, so, for instance, okay, we know that dogs being bitten by fleas will get flea allergy dermatitis. They bite, they scratch, they chew at themselves, they can get the hot spots, you know, those huge lesions, like they're trying to chew off their legs, it seems like sometimes. But what are some of the diseases that fleas can carry? I mean, we're looking at diseases as simple as tapeworms that are not a huge potential for concern of the breed, the species that dogs and cats carry. Some of the exotic uh, species that are out there do carry tapeworms that you and I can get. So we're looking at something that's quite unsightly. We see the small segments on the cat and dog's bedding or on their fur, and there's a, a chance that, that could become important to humans as well, all the way from tapeworms to basically looking at, well, the plague for example. So yeah. we know that the fleas, through their filth, through their feces, do carry the plague in certain parts of the country. The plague still exists. So when we talk about fleas as a human species, we usually concern it with, yes, that irritating jingle of the uh, license and, uh, and rabies <laughs> tag on the collar keeping us up at night, which is probably the biggest reason we get emergency calls for flea control. They're just driving me nuts. They're biting and turning themselves. They can't stop gnawing. And it is certainly very irritating. It has severe health consequences. We're looking at it in, in our real everyday life as veterinarians and, and I think clients is that flea bite dermatitis. We're looking at a very itchy dog, very uncomfortable. The skin almost feels hot as you approach to pet the dog and they hate to be touched. And that's where we're looking at most of the flea problems. I think that concern us every day. I think what people are just shocked with, you know, they have two pets at home. They have a dog, dog and a cat. And they look at the dog and it's tearing itself apart and they bring the dog in and they're concerned with that one. And then there's the cat going, oh, yeah, the cat doesn't seem to be bothered at all. You know, maybe scratches at its ears a little bit. So, you know, it can't have fleas. But it really seems like some pets can be so exquisitely sensitive that all it takes is that one or two flea bites just to set them off, where the other pet in the house can be what I call the flea farm. The fleas are mm. just living on it and sucking on its little blood and just having a good old time and eh, maybe a scratch or two. It's funny how that can be with exactly two dogs in the apartment or the house or the ranch. One dog is bothered by even a handful of fleas. The other one could have 20 to 100 on and just be slightly irritated. And that just goes to show that we know we have dogs that are more sensitive to flea bites. And it's the saliva, the things in the flea saliva that actually cause this allergic reaction, leading to flea bite hypersensitivity flea allergy dermatitis, which is a more severe repercussion of just a few fleas biting and itching. And we'd look at those dogs and say, well, we should just treat that dog as the only one affected. Or if we have the cat, the cats can certainly hide their discomfort. They're a little more sneaky. They're a very unique creature. So they can hide their discomfort a little bit longer, but don't be too comfortable because we do have a lot of folks that have flea bite dermatitis or flea allergy cats. So what we have to do is consider treating both of those or all the pets in the household on a flea control if not, we need to start talking to that client and getting everyone on that, including the ones that come in and out. So you're absolutely right by making that a very strong point to mention. 
And one of the things you're talking about, you know, the various problems associated with fleas. I've seen two dogs in my career, and these were not little chihuahuas. Uh, one was a American Cocker Spaniel. The other was some little terrier mix. But these dogs had so many fleas on them, and it was another cat also. So many fleas on them, they literally were sucked dry. They were so severely anemic because of the blood loss, because that's what fleas are feeding on, is your pet's blood. And when you notice that little black material on their bodies, that's flea dirt, a genteel way of saying flea poop. And it's your pet's blood that's been processed through a flea. Dr. Ed, when should people start treating for fleas? Wait till they see them? I would say we're about three months too late. So that, unfortunately, when we have them come into our clinics, you know, they come in and they say, I've got a flea situation. They should have been on flea prevention, flea control year round. When we're looking at that strong of a recommendation, we say we never know when your pet is going to come in contact with some fleas from another species or another animal in the house or a dog park. Something, someone visits your house that's not on flea control. You have your dog and cat on year-round flea control. They're protected. So that's where we need to, I guess, stress to clients when they come in. It is cheaper. It is certainly healthier. And it is something that's easier to prevent and keep them on flea control year-round. And it's hard to justify that. Some clients have to go through that experience saying never again. And it is a total pain in the rear end because of the life cycle, egg, larva, cocoon, and adult. And the adult is what we typically are paying attention to. And we know that it stays on a pet's body about 90% of the time. But fleas, what I understand, make up about 5% of the entire flea population. So all the rest is in the house. And that cocoon stage is seems to be impervious to almost everything. So I tell my clients the atomic bomb will come and go. We're going to be left with fleas, cockroaches, rats, and politicians. Somehow, <laughs> they will all survive. That's true. And you're absolutely right. And if anything we can do today is let folks know that if you ever have had a flea infestation, you know how tough it is to clear up. If not, and you want to ask an associate or a friend or someone at the dog park and go, hey, have you ever battled that? Oh, yes. You never want to have that happen. You'll see the fear, so to speak, or the agony in their eyes of how tough it was to clear up. Because basically, we have so much living in our carpet, in the small cracks in linoleum even, between the little squares. We can have hundreds of those pupa, eggs, and larvae living there. So you're right. It is definitely better to prevent, and we do have to control that environmentally as well. Well, now that we have everyone's skin just crawling because of talking about fleas, one of the things, thankfully, here in Southern California, we have, but not to the same extent as fleas, at least in my suburban area, are ticks. I do not like fleas. Ticks, I find to be the most disgusting. At least you know when you're being bitten by a flea, it hurts. But ticks are little stealth biters. You never even know when they've embedded their little face parts into your body. Tell us about the joys of ticks. I would say, yes, add ticks to that species that's going to survive the atomic blast. The, the stealth fighter that's a design of a tank is a tick to me. As you and I have been outside, we don't know and don't feel that tick, at least 90% of them, crawling up from the grass on our leg up the shorts. They're so slow, light, and so delicate. Their legs have pads and then a second pad that is so tiny, the surface area that touches your skin or even your hairs is so minimal. That's what I mean by a stealth tank because they're so tough. They're so hard to kill and control. Uh, we're basically looking at them as the, the ultimate of ick factor because when you find them, they're burrowed into your skin. And that's yeah. the worst part. <laughs> You're taking a shower and all of a sudden it's like, I don't remember having a mole there. And then you look closely, it's like, great, the mole has legs. That's yeah. really disgusting. It is. One of the other interesting things that they found two years ago is most people with uh, comparing us to dogs, dogs have a lot more hair than humans. Most people miss about 60 to 70 percent of the small earlier stages of ticks that are on them. So when we do a tick check on our dog and we say, oh, we don't see any ticks, we're talking about a small pinhead sized creature embedded in thousands of hairs per inch, and we're looking at ourselves going, we have very few hairs, and we're in the shower in bright light, and we don't see them until after the fact. So, yes, ticks can be very scary when it comes to our dogs, absolutely. 
Uh, so, Dr. Ed, tell us about some of these wonderful diseases that ticks will carry. Now, we've heard about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, and some of those diseases are transmissible to people. Yes. I mean, we're looking from the East Coast where people are more familiar with Lyme disease. And we have a lot of folks that have moved to the West Coast and they move back and forth. We have people that are basically concerned with anaplasmosis or lichiosis. Those osis type tick-borne agents, disease-causing agents, are the ones that can affect us. And there isn't a vaccine for them in our pets except for one, for Lyme disease. These other things, anaplasmosis or lichiosis, there is no vaccine. There is no protection other than stopping the tick from feeding, those diseases are basically making those dogs bleed. We're basically looking at them to start bleeding out the nose. It's so the slides you see, and if you ever are unfortunate to do a full-blown case, you see these dogs that you're like, what can I do? You put them on symptomatic treatment. You try antibiotics that sometimes help well, but they're already in that stage where they're losing blood like hemorrhaging. It's, It's a very scary proposition. So Lyme disease, everybody understands nowadays could lead to organ failure. We look at chronic infections in humans as, wow, I've got kidney disease. I didn't have any trouble. This is where did this come from? We're finding it the same way in our dog population as well. After being infected with this Lyme disease agent, we're looking at dogs developing kidney disease later on in life and we're tracing it back to that tick bite, so to speak. One of the things that I'll always remember of all the parasitology classes that I took is like, okay, a tick needs to feed for about 24 hours before the infectious agent goes from the tick into that host, whoever they're chewing on. And thinking, okay, so if I find a tick on myself or on my pet dog and I see this tick has been there for eight hours, has it been there 22 hours, does a tick know how to tell time? (laughs) The other question too on this is are they actually embedding their entire head? Because people are always concerned, oh, the tick head was left behind. So tell us, freak us out a little bit about tick feeding and what they're doing. The parts that I get worried about in tick feeding is, yes, if they're attached to your skin and you go to pull on that body and it literally pulls up on your skin, they've been there a good while. They've been looking at how long it takes for various tick species that we are concerned with and the various diseases to transmit. How long does that take? Just to give you the worst part of that, In uh, South America, about three years ago, they did a study where they let ticks feed, then disturbed them and took them off, and then put them back on. The disease transmission time that you're talking about for that, that disease they were looking at usually took about 12 to 24 hours. When they disturbed the tick from feeding and then put it back on the second time, within five minutes, that disease was being transmitted. So we don't know what we don't know more and more about tick-borne disease being transmitted. So if they can be transmitted as early as five minutes because that organism was upset inside the tick and knew it wasn't going to be passed on and geared up to get passed on the next opportunity, that's a formidable foe. So when we are dealing with our dogs and our disease transmission times, we're finding them earlier and earlier. Basically, we're looking at Lyme disease the basic disease that a lot of people can relate to, we're saying, oh, okay, well, how long is that? Is it 24 to 48? In previous years, that's exactly what we found. We're looking at it closely and looking at more accurate diagnostics and finding it maybe at 12 hours or even 16 hours less. The Rickettsia species are 5 to 20 hours in transmission time once that tick starts feeding. Anaplas, 4 hours. And this is the shortest time that we've diagnosed or, or documented. Ehrlichia, three hours. Babesia is another disease at eight hours. So we're seeing these diseases being transmitted earlier. And that's probably great concern. We have to understand that if we know that these ticks get on within an hour, they're starting to feed, we're going to have to stop them from feeding. That's our true key to protecting us and our pets. That's what we're looking at nowadays. Okay, so fleas ticks, disgusting little creatures, suck a lot of blood, you know, spread a lot of diseases. And then there is that one parasite that has killed over 1 million people worldwide every year. And that's mosquitoes. They are, I think I've read and Dr. Ed, correct me if I'm wrong. They have killed more people in the history of mankind than all wars combined. That's right. They are more deadly than to man than man is to itself. Mm. Okay. With that happy news, let's take a break. We'll be right back and talk about mosquitoes. 
Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. What if you could protect the life of your cat with something so simple and affordable that you already use every day? Get ready for the evolution of kitty litter. It's Pretty Litter. Along with all the features you've come to expect from your kitty litter, Pretty Litter's patented and scientific formula will also monitor your cat's health and detect illnesses early while providing industry-leading odor control. Two kitty litters, same cat, same price. But there's one important difference. Pretty Litter reacts to your cat's waste by detecting health issues simply by changing color. And the key is that Pretty Litter detects these issues before your cat shows symptoms of physical illness or pain, likely saving you major dollars in vet bills while protecting the health of your cat. What do you think, little guy? Ready to switch litter? Pretty Litter. Colorful insight into your cat's health. Go to prettylittercats.com forward slash cat 101 or use coupon code cat 101 to get 20% off your first subscription order. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in. And we'll see you now. So, Dr. Ed Kornowski, you have made all of our skins just crawl and want to search ourselves over for every little parasite that may be crawling us. Now let's talk about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes carry all these diseases. What are some of the ones that they have just brought upon mankind and animals, too? I would say if you can think of yellow fever as the scourge and the best marker of what mosquitoes have done to humans, that would be the first. Yellow fever, Denengue fever, we're looking at tropical areas of the the globe that have these diseases and we're finding these mosquito species moving about and we're finding these diseases are not eradicated and we're looking at them and going, well, that's rough. Well, there's also malaria. Oh, okay, malaria. And when people travel to those countries, we're re-exposed to them when they're not from those areas. So when it comes to humans, those diseases that have had quite a a time with us are still there. Some of them have been reduced greatly. Certain countries, certain areas, they've done wonderful things at reducing mosquitoes through multimodal approaches using many different ways. In our dog population, it is the heartworm disease that is carried by the mosquito in the United States. That's the worst vector-borne disease we encounter. So heartworm disease is our scourge here in the United States when it comes to dogs. The encephalitis-type viruses that are carried as well are starting to be found in other species. There's certainly some we know that are in horses, and we're seeing those in dogs occasionally. Those are carried by mosquitoes. We see those encephalitis viruses in people now, and, and there isn't the any Zika type virus. of vaccine. There you go. The, the new ones that are coming into our country, Zika virus is another one, been held in check so far through aggressive approaches through the Department of Ag, city officials, county health officials, state officials. So that is something that with global travel, we're dealing with more and more. And I don't even want to start about the new tick species found in the Northeast just recently in sheep. So we're getting those in. And climate change probably isn't helping a lot also because here we've had some of these mosquitoes that have been uh, the, what is it, Asian tiger mosquito? Mm -hmm. I know when I went to my recent Home Depot and they have signs all over, be careful. And typically think, okay, you're going to have a bird bath that's just been sitting there and water gets grungy. But oftentimes it's just little itty bitty amounts of on your curbs. You have some leaf debris and a little bit of moisture that's built up and then you have the right temperatures. Mosquitoes can live in an amazingly small quantity of water. That's I think what really Californians deal with the most are the microclimates. There are so many vast areas, we'll say west of the Rockies, that have just wonderful arid areas that keep the parasite burden almost to a minimum where you're not even concerned. And you folks have been very fortunate 
Now we have the microclimate that we're identifying as where these mosquitoes will hide out in. One of the uh, fun things is looking at websites from CDC or from the uh, Companion Animal Parasite Council that say, what are the best climates for mosquitoes? I mean, people didn't realize it, but New York City is one of the top 10. Why? Because of all those steam vents, all that wonderful cold weather they have to put up with. They have microclimates by the thousands every square block. And wow. the same thing happens in other cities, and that's where these mosquitoes are present. That's where we get the danger from. So you've been talking about heartworm disease, and that is something we do you know, in California recommend year-round heartworm disease because before we used to say, oh, it's just going to be a seasonal issue. And I believe that's one thing that we're now trying to really work about and just having people be so aware it's a year-round concern because you're saying these microclimates. What is heartworm disease? People maybe heard about it and go, I don't know, is my dog susceptible to it? Basically, yes. Every dog that is not on a preventive year-round, once a month, and they have a once-every-six-month injection as well, is exposed potentially because mosquitoes are found pretty much wherever that dog is going to be. Whether or not those mosquitoes are carrying the heartworm at that moment, we don't know, but we know it's everywhere. So what we have is a disease that can be fatal, but either way, if the dog gets it and doesn't pass away very early, it is going to pass away earlier. The heart disease that happens is much like heart failure in people. So you'll have a dog kind of after being infested with the adult worms because they grew from the immature worms that got inside there through the mosquito feeding, will basically start getting heart blockage, blood flow changes that slow down and decrease the efficiency, much like uh, heart disease in people. So over time, they may all of a sudden see the dog isn't as active. They don't do the fun things the dog used to do. They gain a little weight in their belly. They're losing little muscle tones. They look a little thinner. And then the cough starts. That little... like a kennel cough or just a little <clears throat> and they don't know why, they bring them to the veterinarian, they hear these hear these sounds in the lungs, it's a little late, now we take radiographs, do blood work, oh my gosh, the dog has heartworm disease, probably for the last year or two even. So mm. what we have now are some very typical signs that people can relate to and eventualities that they can relate to through, well, it's kind of like heart disease in humans. It slows people down and progressively makes them weaker so they can have severe complications. So it really seems backwards for us to be trying to treat this disease, you know, once it's there because the damage that's gone on to the heart, the lungs, etc., and the longevity, the quality of life for that pet. So prevention, yes, but how do you know your, you know, animal still being bitten by these mosquitoes is and no medication we know is 100%. So the new focus, I know Siva has really come up with a different view on trying to prevent our animals from being exposed to these biting animals. What's the new focus? We know now that we basically protected our dogs for 30 years with a heartworm preventive once a month. And it's done extremely well as far as how effective it's been. And it still continues to be very effective. What we have now are some changes. We know now that if you use that same monthly or every six-month injection prevention, plus stop the mosquitoes from feeding as they come touch your dog and land. Drive them away where they'll go away and die. You protect your pet better. That's what the research of this new multimodal or basically multi-approach way of protecting a dog from getting infected with the heartworms and not getting the heartworm disease. What we're looking at is mimicking what we do in the human world, a multimodal approach to preventing mosquito-borne diseases from getting to humans. We will use environmental control, obviously. We'll use impregnated netting. We'll use impregnated clothing. We'll be using repellents on us as well. We have repellents for dogs that do the same thing. And if some of those mosquitoes do get through and do feed, you have your monthly prevention in there. But none of those work unless the dog is on it all the time year round. That way, you know, that dog's protected no matter where it goes in the state or even the United States. So it's really a one-two double defense type of a punch to keep our pets, our dogs, safe. It is. It's basically saying 30 years of doing it one way, we need to approach differently. We need to look at it. And that's what a very brilliant scientist did and said, what else could we do if the human world says, let's stop the insect from feeding? 
One, you get rid of the ick factor. That's what it's important to people. We found that people, regardless of how severe the disease is, they come back and say, but wait a minute, I could put my dog on a topical that doesn't allow them to get bit? I don't want my dog getting bit. That's icky. Yes, and by the way, you're also protecting it against vector-borne diseases from fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes and biting flies. Oh, yeah, that's great, too, but I don't want my dog getting bit. And that's where we're at now. Yes, it's that uh, bloodletting mosquito episode that I had back in Minnesota. It's like, uh uh-uh, if I could have just put a little bubble around myself, it was beautiful outside. I wanted to be out there, but it's like, nope. These little guys were getting through every type of lotion potion that I could stick on myself. We do have uh, something in the human world called DEET, D, capital E, capital E-T, and it is an approved uh, repellent for people. However, it is not proved or safe for use on pets of any kind. And what that does, it actually blinds or makes that insect not able to find the host, we'll say, in a simplistic way. But they don't necessarily go away and die. What we do know about how we approach it using topicals now in veterinary medicine for dogs is they will approach still, they will land on the dog, and they will contact this superficial insecticide, and they will go away and die before they feed. So they will leave the pet and go away and not be able to infect another pet. So there's a double plus to this as well, we think. If you have an ability to protect that dog, plus maybe the neighbor's dog. What if the neighbor's dog isn't on anything and that mosquito fed on that dog and a few weeks later comes to your dog? So you're kind of looking at saying, what else could I do to protect my dog if I can't control the rest of the world or the community? My neighbors don't or there's wild dogs running around or stray dogs or whatever. You look at and say, I can put them on a topical that kills and repels mosquitoes and fleas, ticks, and biting flies. That's the way we would look at it nowadays. With all the bad weather and disasters that happen throughout the United States, people are so loving and oftentimes will take dogs and cats that are in one part of the United States with diseases that they have there. And I remember back when we had uh, Hurricane Maria come through and hear all these dogs and they needed some place to go. I said, okay, we'll go ahead and we'll move them from the panhandle of Florida and we'll take them to California. Well, that was awesome. And people brought them into their homes and gave them love and they were doing so well. But oftentimes these dogs were bringing diseases with them, like heartworm disease. So we know we have the vector here in California. So we were bringing in disease. We were spreading disease. So having this topical and doing the monthly, boy, that just sounds like a win-win situation all the way around. It it really is a win-win, and it's very new. It's not widely adopted yet because as new science comes along, we have to embrace it and then go out and tell our clients, and we have to get that word out nationally. So when we find that these dogs are being rehomed states away from heartworm endemic areas to states that have never had heartworm, we're looking at those dogs as being tested perhaps properly or improperly. Perhaps they were negative on the first test and they show up in another state months later and the test, oh my goodness, it's positive. Well, how long has that dog been in that neighborhood with mosquitoes feeding on it, now spreading heartworm disease that wasn't there before in the local population? So that's really where our kind-heartedness has got us into a fix. And that alone, aside from one one other factor, has changed heartworm disease in this country. We've had massive movements of dogs from states that have heartworm to states that didn't necessarily have a high center of it. Basically, California, the top 10 heartworm cities in April from the Companion Animal Parasite Council said there was San Francisco, Fontana, and Salinas on the list as cities to watch for heartworm disease. They were never really concerned about that before. The second kicker, besides movement of animals, is that there is resistance to that 30-year-old product that we've been using. The active ingredient has not changed in 30 years. Resistance has developed to that. So what we're looking at is saying now resistance used to be thought of as in just one or two states. Well, it's been found to be in all 50 states now. So that changes how we have to approach this disease. If we need to keep that ingredient around even longer than 30 years, keep it around another 30 years and keep this resistance from spreading, let's reduce the number of mosquitoes being exposed to it. Let's stop the number of mosquitoes from feeding on dogs by using a contact kill and repellent. That's where we're going. Dr. Ed, people are listening to this going, okay, but I have children in the house and I really don't want to use an insecticide on my pet because I'm concerned my child's going to have exposure to it or I have cats in the house. The product that we've been talking about 
of this a repellent. What's the name of it, number one? We haven't even mentioned the name. No, we haven't. We've been talking very high level, you know, top of the view. Uh, Vectra 3D for dogs is what I'm representing and what I'm talking about that has this research backing it up. So Vectra is just using for dogs, correct? Correct. We have no product that protects cats in our arsenal at, uh, at Siva Animal Health for cats to protect them from mosquitoes. We're only talking about dogs and using Vectra 3D on dogs only. And Vectra 3D is safe to use on dogs? Yes. The components, the three active ingredients, are safe for dogs. They've been used for many years, and they don't affect the other species, such as other mammals. There is one ingredient, permethrin, that does affect cats, so that's why we make a big deal about making sure it's only used on dogs. And in mixed species households, such as cat dog households, once the product is applied to the dog and is dry, which is usually 6 to 12 hours, the chance of that cat getting ill from getting any of that product off the dog is virtually nil. So it's reduced so greatly because it's dry on the dog. And that's where most people get confused. They buy something from the store without any professional consulting, a uh, permethrin product from over-the-counter. It's labeled for dogs or it's labeled for another species. It looks similar to an old product they used or they didn't get advice at all because no one was there to help them. And that's where we find most of the problems with permethrin intoxicosis in cats is they're usually, usually using the dog product by mistake on the cats. This product is available through veterinarians only, and we go through great lengths to mark the package and consult our veterinary technicians, the staff at the hospital, and the doctors to counsel the patients when they come in and say, hey, I've got this great repellent. By the way, it's for dogs only, and that's where we eliminate a lot of that risk. So if you were to put it on the dog at night, for instance, before you go to bed, put the kitty in the bedroom with you so the cat gets, oh, oh this is good. No dumb dog in the room with me tonight. You know, I have people all to myself. So the kitty hangs out on the bed all night. Everyone wakes up in the morning. The children are safe to play with the dog. The cats are okay to go back and tussle with the dog. Everything is copacetic, correct? Yes, we go through a couple of tips for that in mixed species household, and a lot of times that's it. We do also say, why don't you treat the dog in the evening with the Vectra 3D and kennel them? And then everybody's happy. Everybody wakes up in the morning. One of the things about safety people ask about is, what about children? And I say, well, what about children? Well, doesn't this affect children? I say, well, no, the risk is minimal. These ingredients don't act on the human Systems. They don't act on the basically the dog's nervous system or the human nervous system. They work on the insect's nervous system. And when you think about what about the familiarity with some of these ingredients, well, permethrin is used in head lice shampoos and, mm. or humans. It's used in impregnated clothing across the world. The entire military of the United States uses permethrin impregnated clothing throughout the world where they need that. There are commercial preparations now where some of the clothing lasts up to basically 70 washings, so it's very well adhered. So if a cat walked on it, there'd be minimal chance of that happening as long as it's dry and they don't ingest the liquid. That's really what we're concerned about. And with humans, we're looking at that as something that people want to know about. Where are these pesticides coming from? What's so trustworthy about them or what's so scary? Well, permethrins have been around for a good while. We know exactly what they do. And when they're on the target species, meaning the dog, and they're not going anywhere else and they're applied correctly, they're probably some of the safest pesticides people come across. It sounds like this is just really the way to go. If my listeners want to learn more about parasite control, Vectra 3D, where should they go? There's two sites, Bites Bite, and that's B-I-T-E-S, B-I-T-E, Bites Bite, that contrasts what we have for protection for our dogs now. Do we have orals? We sure do. Do we have topicals? We sure do. What information would a client like to know about that? More specifically, uh, Vectra Pet dot com is about basically Vectra 3D and finding out which veterinarians in your neighborhood carry that, which veterinarians near you carry that. There's a veterinarian finder. And that really helps. It gets a lot of product information and then you can go in and talk to your veterinarian. Hey, what am I on? What do you recommend? And I'm concerned as a client about this parasite or this disease. What can you tell me? And that's really what we're trying to gain here. If we can get people on protection year round and they're doing something more than they're doing now, we're happy. We're never going to be a happy profession unless people say, yep, every one of my dogs 
is on year-round parasite protection. Guess what? Every one of my cats is as well. Then I know you'll see smiling veterinarians like you've never seen before. But at least right now, we have something to offer that we haven't had before, so I do appreciate it. My guest today has been Dr. Ed Kornowski, Technical Veterinary Service Manager for SEVA Animal Health. We've been chatting about taking the bite out of what's bugging your pet. So thank you very much for listening to us today and hope that you've learned a little something. If you want to learn more, tune in again next week. We'll give you more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. And please follow me on Facebook, Dr. Cruz and Pets, to give you ideas throughout the week. So Dr. Bernadine Cruz has been chatting with you. It's been my pleasure. Dr. Ed, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cruz. It's certainly been a pleasure. Tune in next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.